like to firstly start by saying MSF must acknowledge our Minister for Children, Anne Tolley, for showing committed leadership and ability to listen and learn. Um, she's the first ever Minister in Aotearoa to go to Geneva for a periodic review of our country's progress on the rights of children. And that's um, committed leadership. Um, not only was she part of the government's presentation, she listened to criticism from the United Nations Child Rights Committee in Geneva and she learned from it. So this is why we have legislation before us that amends the SIFT Act to uphold the following principles of United Nations. One, that the views of the child are heard. Two, that decisions being made are in the children's best interest. And three, that the government has ultimate accountability to all children's survival and development in Aotearoa. So there's a lot to acknowledge and congratulate this government for. Uh, the changing direction of the journey it's on, caring for children when they are vulnerable to the breaches of their rights. This is change of direction which is bold and the decision to change direction is in itself uh, some way the hardest step. So congratulations to our Minister for taking that. Uh, we also thank the Select Committee for inviting UNICEF to come and be one of the first to speak to this legislation and its change of direction. After all, um, UNICEF is the custodian of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. We've advocated for this change in direction since 1993, when Aotearoa first signed to the Convention. Next year, our com commitment to the Convention will be 25 years old. And so, as we look to celebrate this milestone, let us ensure that this legislation has done what it says it's set out to do. We'll take our written submission as read, and we note areas throughout the legislation that are not fit for bold purpose of upholding the Convention's principles and the rights of children in Aotearoa. My advocacy manager, Dr Pruden Stone, will summarise the areas of the legislation that have least clarity and she will take your questions and with regard to the rest of our written submission. So our reading is through a child rights lens. Our recommendations are minimal. They are the very least you must do to ensure this legislation sets out to do what it says it's trying to do. More organisations and communities will come after us with the Treaty of Waitangi lens. That will draw focus on details of the legislation that are least clear in upholding um, its four articles. We support these details and the recommendations that come from these organisations and communities also because government's commitment to the Treaty of Waitangi is older than its commitment to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. More organisations and communities, families and victims of past state care abuse will come. They will argue that this legislation cannot have passage before an independent inquiry is held that will inform this and future governments of the failures, the mistakes, the wrongs of staff and state that have violated the rights of children of Aotearoa in the past. Um, these past horrific accounts, as told to the Special Listening and Assistance Service, put an onus on this legislation to prevent from ever happening again the abuses and neglect as documented happening before. So you'll note in our submission we support this call for an inquiry. There will be organisations, communities, families and victims that come after UNICEF saying there are too many areas to amend, too many dangers in the way this legislation, legislation is written and that its passage into law cannot be supported. They will oppose this legislation as a whole. Well, we think you should never throw a baby out of the bathwater. We support the step our Minister for Children has taken to update legislation so that the new ministry takes a journey in a new direction charged with upholding the principles of the Convention. No one said it was going to be easy. As I said before, our recommendations are the minimal requirements necessary to ensure this legislation steers us in a bold new direction. While we continue our support and inform this, in, uh, this journey, we insist upon the measures we recommend being taken before UNICEF can accept this legislation as fit for its intended purpose. Thank you. Accountability and culture change. Two areas that this legislation has least clarity. The area with the least clarity in this legislation is accountability. Where it lies and how it will be ensured. On one hand, it ensures the Convention's principle that government's responsibility is to the children it cares for. But there's a section, 445F, it's been inserted next to clause 118, asserting no liability of the Crown and Minister for what happens to children placed in care as a consequence of the actions of others. The actions of others? Do you mean the actions of others procured as services by the state 
to implement this legislation. Or the action of others assigned caregiving duty to children, removed by the state in accordance with this legislation. All of these actions taken by others will be a direct result of the state's actioning of this legislation. We don't want to argue over this like we did with leaky homes, years and years debating over who is responsible. These are vulnerable children in the care of the state. The buck stops with the state. The Māori name of the new ministry is in the title of this bill and various authorities of delegation and establishment of processes, including the complaints process for if or when things still go wrong, are duties laid out clearly for the Ministry's Chief Executive. So at the feet of this Chief, Chief Executive and the new Ministry, the responsibility of implementing this legislation is laid. But responsibility is not a legal word. All of a sudden we have this section 445F on liability. Past violations, abuses and neglect have been claimed by to date around 11,000 New Zealanders. So much liability and it was anticipated. It was a growing tide of claimants. So the government established a special listening and assistance service to mediate for government reconciliation with victims as quietly as possible and on a case by case basis. But very recently, a treaty claim for Māori children in state care has been laid before the Waitangi Tribunal. <coughs> Let's be clear what this indicates. The Crown and Government's current liability to ongoing litigation and grievance against them for past wrongs to children in state care is real, it's known and it's expensive. We struggle to trust in this legislation's show of government's responsibility when it slips in a disclaimer of liability. This is an inconsistency. While Section 445F permits Crown and Government to shirk this final account, all ways their responsibility are written into this legislation become somewhat meaningless. There is no regulation of the outsourcing of services to children uh, to private enterprises nor how to insist on these services' compliance with the child-centred approach. To return to the Chief Executive, who is to establish a complaints process, the legislation gives no adequate assurance to children and their families that as a result of going through this complaints process, the actions of individuals and services following or not following policy will be held accountable, that policies and services will be subject to change. We note there is no clarity whether people will have options of how to complain, whether culturally appropriate options will be developed, catering to New Zealand's diversity of peoples, diversity of children, whether complaints from people will be guaranteed investigation, prosecution and sanction of the perpetrators, whether all complaints will be recorded in a disaggregated database so that any impact on education and healthcare, any inequalities of outcome are being monitored by government. These are the ways you are accountable to children in your care. Without these means to accountability, this bill is hollow. Child centeredness is not just a method, neither is best interest of the child. They are principles for New Zealand's care of children. They need clear definitions, practical definitions that are promoted widely. Practical in that they provide for every scenario clarity on pathways of information for children and decision making by the adults serving them. This bill is calling for mass cultural change of the sector workforce. Do you know how hard culture change is to do? This legislation does little to determine how. But here's a start. Ensure common understanding of the child-centred approach across the care system with the allocation of adequate human, technical and financial resources to care services to ensure this common understanding. Ensure awareness raising programs, campaigns and dissemination services activities to ensure that children's rights are widely known by children themselves. 
And the workforce working with children needs systematic training, private or government funded. This includes all law enforcement officials and staff, teachers, health personnel, social workers, and those working in childcare institutions. This is a massive cultural change that will take an all of government approach. The trickle down impact of this approach could be magnificent, not just in ensuring the robust implementation of child centred state care, but perhaps in ensuring a higher valuing of children no matter where they are in New Zealand. We can see Minister Tolly is capable and willing to take leadership on this and we look forward to questions regarding more of our recommendations. Thank you very much, Jacinda. Um, thank you in particular um, for highlighting in your submission, I think something that in amongst the rightful focus that has been around things like priority of fire replacement. Thank you for coming in and highlighting some additional elements of the bill that needs our focus, like for instance, section 445. Um, I just quickly pulled up this legislation because of course it says that the liability won't extend to those outside of the chief executive and delegated powers. But one of the groups that won't extend to are approved persons. So basically anyone that places um, a child with. So that's, that's very broad and far reaching. And you've pointed out all reasons why we have problems with that currently with our historic claims process. Because it would therefore be a breach of uncrop, is your support of this bill contingent on that section being removed? Is that the amount of weight you would place on it? We're saying that this government is taking a huge risk leaving a liability disclaimer into its legislation while it's a signatory nation to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. There, there, there could be a legal argument against this government. Mm -hmm. uh, and so due diligence on that legal ramification really should be made transparent to the public so that we've, we can trust that this... Um, that, that account of where the accountability for children lies. Um, a, as a signatory to the convention, one of the principles of that convention is that the buck stops with government. Yeah. And so for a liability disclaimer to be in the small print um, needs investigation. You, you need to really do your due diligence before letting this, Isn't letting this pass. Well, at the moment, the Crown is already trying to deny that it has any um, responsibility via the historic claims process. There are already cases where the Crown claims not to have liability where abuse was perpetrated by approved caregivers, and that perhaps they're trying to now formalise what is an existing practice for them. Mm. Well, yeah, so we, we, we've noted the historical context. Well, I'm happy to bring the cases if you'd like to see them. I know this here. Oh, I've got to say, just answer this and then the final question to Jan. We'll run out of time. Yeah, well, we, we already noted that historical context in which that act, this Act resides, that confidential listening and assistance service report found a culture of state care prior to 1993 that was flimsy about what it was there to do. Uh, and no prior to prioritisation of expertise and skill throughout its staff, wide-scale locking up of children into institutions. Um, but let's look at now and the current cultural context of wider New Zealand. We have one of the worst rates of family violence in the world. Our youth suicide rates are high. Gender inequality is reflected in the, in the um, difference of income between working men and women, in the high proportion of sole parent households in the lowest income quantile, one in three women have experienced a sexual harassment or assault by the time they're 16. 90% of those sexual assaults committed by somebody they know. I mean, could it be that the wider culture of New Zealand um, and, the, and the, the state's poor past model of state care of children are related? Final question, Jan. Um, thanks. Um, and thanks. Thank you for those very critical points. And you make a lot of other points in your submission that I, I wish I could have time to um, talk to. But actually, I just want to talk, go back to a point that you made verbally as well about the need for allocation of resources to be able to support the culture change within our child protection system. And whether 
you think we should be doing any specific work around the fact that the regulatory impact statement um, noted that there's no significant fiscal impacts to this legislation, which may indicate that <laughs> the Crown is not intending on resourcing um, these, that culture change? It's going to come from some budget, and if, they, if, they, if, if this is, is going to actually happen out in um, New Zealand's environment and social, social environment, it is going to take social investment. That's um, the approach that this government claims to be taking. Um, that's definitely got to be assured. And if, we, if this isn't resourced, and this legislation and a new body set up, and there's the ability to privatise these child protection services without the resource going into the culture change, do you think that risks making things worse? Well, I think we can just return. I, th I think the um, New Zealand Christian Council, uh, Council of Christian Services said it best. Um, there's every likelihood that it can spiral down without the proper resourcing. These are the, the, the resourcing is an urgent recommendation that comes from the Child Rights Committee in Geneva. It's been a re repeated um, recommendation for 24 years now, and now urgent. Uh, so yeah, resourcing is a, is a major issue for New Zealand. Okay, thank you very much for taking the time.